I invite your attention to James today, the, the book of James. We're going to look at the fifth chapter for a few moments. Several years ago, I worked with a man whose name was Chuck Phillips. Chuck spent most of his life working in an international company. In fact, he, he owned the company. When he sold the company he, and, and entered into retirement, he became our facilities manager in a church. Now, all of his work in the past had carried him into places uh, literally around the world and not been in facilities, but he was an absolutely super, super person working in facilities management for us and, and worked well beyond any expectation. But one of the things that happens in the church from time to time is uh, something doesn't go exactly like you planned. And he would, he would say, we had a hiccup, Pastor. We had a hiccup. And he called those interruptions or those things that didn't work exactly right, he called them a hiccup. Now, I've used hiccups for another term but because I'd get some air caught in my, my chest somewhere, and, and maybe that's how you've used it. But when he used hiccup, he was using it for a difficulty. When James writes, he writes to a group of people who are experiencing some hiccups. Not the kind that go, but, but the kind that interrupt, interrupt. And so James tries to encourage them. And the first thing he wants them to do is to practice patience. Wow. Be patient then, brothers, he writes, until the Lord's coming. He goes on to say, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. Be patient. Practice long-suffering or practice self-restraint. Restrain yourselves. Hold yourselves back. Thomas Akempis said it this way as he tried to help people understand the struggle we have with patience. He said, he is not truly patient who will suffer only as much as he pleases from whom he pleases. <laughs> Did you get that? I'm willing to suffer if it's in the thing I choose. If it's from the person I choose. But the rest of the time, no, no. No, Akempis said, that's not right. You're not patient if you can't be patient with everyone and in all circumstances. Now, get, James gives us the example of the farmer. The farmer plants the seed, and he wants the autumn rains. The autumn rains are going to help the seed germinate. And then there's going to be a long period of time when the farmer really doesn't see much taking place because everything is underground. He's not in control of what's going on underground. He may have tried to fertilize. He may have tried to make sure that it was properly dealt with. But he's not really in control of that, nor is he in control of the weather. But he does pray for the spring rains because when the spring rains come, those rains strengthen the stalks of the grain so that they can hold the heads up high and properly handle the grain. Now, He's saying, James is saying, as farmers, farmers have to trust the circumstances. They trust God with the circumstances, no matter what happens. And he, James is saying, we must trust God as we recognize we don't have any control over a lot of the circumstances in our lives. No control. He goes on to say, you must be patient. You know, sometimes we have to hear be patient several times. I do, and I know, I know many of you do too. You be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. I want to focus on the word stand firm for just a moment. Because stand firm can also be understood as strengthen your hearts or fortify your hearts or prop up your hearts. If I go to the grocery store and I, and I look at, at cereal, I'll find cereals that are fortified with vitamins. I may find vitamins that are fortified with this, that, and something else. 
But as I, as I study this passage, it's saying, fortify your hearts. Now, what James is doing is he is just reemphasizing something he's already talked about. For in the first chapter, he talked about avoiding being double-minded. In the fourth chapter, he talked about the need for us to avoid being self-deceived, letting our heart be deceived. And then in the fifth chapter, a couple of times, he's addressing the need to be purified, to have our hearts purified. We'd almost think of David saying, create in me a clean heart, O God. For what he's trying to do is, is clean his heart. You see, James knew what Jesus taught. Jesus taught our hearts are the soil in which the Word of God is planted, Luke 8. And as the soil, we either allow that Word to germinate or we do not. We allow it to take hold or we do not. If we're failing to trust God in our difficulties, we fail because we've not fixed our hearts on God. We've turned our focus or our attention to other things in other places. Be patient addresses our need to focus on God and to, to trust God in the difficult circumstances. Impatience can lead us to disobedience. With Moses, impatience kept him out of the promised land. With Abraham, if impatience birthed Ishmael. And there's been division among the people of God in the Middle East ever since. Impatience worked through Simon Peter's life in many different ways. And on the night before the crucifixion, it's Simon Peter who's impatient, who, who literally slices a man's ear off. Impatience also almost led him to killing the man. But our Lord restored the man. When impatience attacks us, we have a tendency to, to run ahead of God. Do you hear that? To run ahead of God and lose our way. Of course, we're all like sinners. And each has lost, gone his own way. Hmm. All right. Now... James says, because the Lord's coming is near. One of the themes in the New Testament is the nearness of God. Now, I believe James' reference to the Lord being near is a twofold reference. One, to remind the people in the circumstances in which they find themselves, the Lord is near. Two, he is speaking of the second advent. We celebrate this time of year looking forward to the first coming of the Lord. But we believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return again. And James cast light on that as he speaks of the Lord's coming being near. He's saying, be patient, be patient. And of course, we recognize with the Lord, time is certainly not the, not the same as with us. For a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day with the Lord. And time just flies for us. Be patient. Practice patience. But also practice peacemaking. Wow. As James looked at the people, he recognized that when, when circumstances pushed in on them, they had a tendency to push out. And in verse 9, he says, Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you'll be judged. Don't grumble. Grumble. Groan, growl, pick, fault finding, criticize, cut to pieces. You know, sometimes friendly fire just tears us apart as we blame our troubles on somebody else. If the truth were known, some of us are sitting side by side with someone in this room that we blamed everything on. And part, though we may be touching, part of that cold wall between us is our blaming. Love does not rejoice at wrong, but love rejoices in right. Why? Because love is patient and kind. It's not jealous or boastful. It does not 
push for its own way. Don't grumble when we have difficulty and impatience with God. We have a tendency to be impatient with each other. And when we're impatient with each other, we are quick to point out the wrongs in each other and slow to see our own foibles, our own wrongs, our own errors. Now, you can almost see the twinkle in James' eye as he writes, because the Lord is near, or the Lord is at the door, or the judge is standing at the door. What is he saying? He's saying, here you are backbiting, here you are squabbling, here you are fault-finding, and who's just outside that door? Who hears? You know, as pastor, I've knocked on doors more than once. But before you knock, you have to stand by the door, don't you? And as I've stood by the door, I've heard what's on the other side of the door. And it's not been nice. And I've knocked on the door, and people have opened the door. Oh, pastor, we're so glad to see you. (laughs) They're not. They're not. But just heard. What James is saying, the Lord's standing outside the door. He's listening. He's listening. I wish we could understand that in all of our little conversations where we chew each other up. Practice peacemaking. But also practice perseverance. Practice perseverance. As we we seek to work together, we practice perseverance. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. The prophets often suffered. Now, let me say to you this. I have long read the prophets. I've read the prophets many times. I've read the life of Jesus many times. I've read the experiences of Paul many times. But this is made of stone. I am very hard-headed. And it took a long time for me to understand that the prophets suffered. I knew that. Jesus suffered. I knew that. Paul suffered. I knew that. Others who followed Jesus suffered. I can tell you the way the different disciples died according to tradition. I know that. But you know what? When I suffered, you would have thought it was the worst thing that had ever happened in the world. You see, I didn't know how to translate the fact that walking with God also brings about suffering. I know that one of the ways Satan works on us is says, you're suffering because of your sin. You're suffering because of your unfaithfulness. But Jesus teaches us that we're going to suffer if we are faithful. In fact, When Paul writes to Timothy, Paul says, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why are we surprised when we suffer? The will of God will never lead us to a place where the grace of God cannot keep us. Today, Sahid Abedini finds himself imprisoned in Iran because of his work with orphans and the gospel. And today he deals with one day where he's treated kindly and told he'll be home for Christmas with his daughters. And the next day he's told he's brutally treated, beaten up, whipped, and told he's going to die. And he goes up and down and up and down and back and forth and back and forth and still remains one of 200 million Christians who are persecuted in today's cultures, in today's world. 
as we deal with the pressures that are placed on us by difficulty, it is important for us to recognize that this is one of the ways that God, God has a way of working. It's not something we can understand, but it's something that happens. In James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Humbly accept the word of God planted in you, which can save you. One of the ways that we fortify our hearts is, is we accept the word of God that is planted in us because it can save us. And we, we allow it to penetrate. You know, the prophets sensed the hearing of God's word in their lives. They wrote God's word under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And we choose to pray and ask that same Holy Spirit to speak to us as we open God's Word and read God's Word. We can hear God's Word. We can understand God's Word. We can find God's light on that which we believe. We also will face persecution and rejection. But don't let your afflictions break your heart. Don't let them break your spirit. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, as you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Well, let's just pause for a minute. Job is called an example of patience in the face of difficulty. But when I read about Job, I see impatience, impatience, impatience. How is he a man of patience? Yet he speaks so impatiently. Chapter 1, Job tells us that, that in various ways, Job's property, his wealth is, is destroyed. And then his children are killed. He loses his family except for his wife. And we don't read very far in Job until she is saying to him, why don't you commit suicide? Curse God and die. And, and we see also that Job loses his health. He cries out in the midst of his pain, but he cries out to God. Job has no idea what's going on, for God's ways are not man's ways. He doesn't know what chapter 2 teaches us about Satan working in his life to destroy his faith. He doesn't know that. And so he cries out, seeking a word from God, but God is silent. And he has friends that come and stand with him, and they call him a sinner and a hypocrite. You know, Satan has a wonderful way of bringing people to false conclusions about the things taking place in our lives, seeking to disrupt our faith. Well, these friends come, and, and, and Job complains about his innocence and asks God to speak. And you see this in chapter after chapter after chapter. And so I say, how can a man who complains so much be an example of patience? And then I discover it at the end. As I look back through the whole picture and not just one tree, one verse. Or another verse, or another verse. What I see is, Job is taking these complaints to God. And as the, the issues surface with the friends, Job turns them over to God. Job's called a man of patience because he turns his issues to God and walks through them little by little. Job says in Job chapter 13 verse 15, Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I'm trusting him. You know, sometimes God allows our trials to strengthen us, to prove the gold in us to refine us I've often seen the testimonies of people's lives or heard them seen them and people watch them but when people walk through the greatest difficulties it's the testimony of them walking through the difficulty that authenticates their testimony I can say great things about God, but not until I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not until I go through the dark night of the soul, 
Do you see the authenticity of the faith I proclaim when nothing difficult is happening with me? And Job's faith comes beautifully out of the furnace of affliction. Job will write in chapter 23, verse 10, He knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I will come forth as gold. I'll be pure. I'll be all right. Job's patience was not passive silence. Job's patience was a brave spirit that confronted his doubts, that wrestled with his sorrows and his calamities, that sought to find God. And in that search, he came through with a stronger faith. And so James says, look at Job. And he finishes the part of our text for today with the words, blessed are those who have persevered. Now look at those words carefully. Blessed are those who persevered. Remember this. You cannot persevere without a trial. You cannot persevere without a trial. You cannot win a victory without a battle. You don't have mountains without valleys. You cannot persevere without a trial. Blessed are those who have persevered. Trials are not strange, bad things that happen to us. They are the ways that we find God in a complex world. Now, James shifts our attention from what happens to us to the faith God is forming in us. And when we walk away from this text, we recognize that when life's hiccups happen to us, God is still with us. He will work in us, and He will see us through what happens to us. Father, Our lives are in your hands. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. In this room, we spell suffering not only with different alphabets or characters, but through the different experiences in which we live. I pray that each person in this room will sense the nearness of your presence. That each person will feel the freedom to speak clearly, honestly, with you as they work through the questions, the whys, the what now. The how could I? Which way should I go? God, let your spirit work in our, in our forming of questions and in our search for answers. Knowing full well that sometimes we're going to find the answers. And sometimes we're going to find the answers are beyond us. Grant us patience to trust you 
with what we know and what we don't know. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.